Hello and welcome to Dialogue. For the past 72 years, Southwest China's Xizang Autonomous Region, also known as Tibet, has experienced rapid socio-economic development. High up in Xizang's mountains, there is a charm and mystery that keep arousing the curiosity of people outside this region. What does life here today look like? And how is Xizang accommodating its Asian way of life to modern development? To answer these questions and more, I'm joined by Asghar Muhammad, a special correspondent of the Associated Press of Pakistan in China. And in the second half of the show, I will be talking with Roland Boer, a professor at Renmin University of China. Both of them attended the just concluded forum on the development of Xizang. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to Dialogue, Asghar. Uh, you have been to this development forum of uh, Xizang. Uh, tell us, what's your takeaway? First of all, thank you very much uh, for giving me an opportunity to talk uh, about Tibet and you mentioned this forum. So I just uh, attending the opening ceremony and the plenary session of uh, this forum. And uh, it, is, uh, it has a great success. And I think that the remaining uh, program will also achieve its targets. Mm -hmm. And also, you have been to uh, Xizang for a couple of times. I wonder, you know, what's your impression? Uh, you know, you know, with the interval of like four or five years. Yes, uh, visiting Xizang at Tibet is a really a treat. So first time I got an opportunity uh, to visit Lhasa and its surrounding area in Tibet region in 2018 and uh, second time I recently last week I was in uh, uh, Linje city and then uh, Lhasa again and it was a wonderful experience and I have seen a, a remarkable uh, uh, progress not only in the economic prog progress but social progress and, and, uh, all, and more particularly in the uh, life of the people people livelihoods so you said about the change of people's livelihood you know I, I you know this reminds me of this um, achievement of um, uh, this poverty uh, alleviation uh, basically free from ab ab abject uh, you know, uh, poverty in this region so do you see that you know, the kids they are, as you say they are from uh, you know farmers uh, uh, surrounding areas uh, there is anything you know change probably improvement in terms of their manners in terms of their you know, spirit? Actually, uh, we also visited uh, some households in, 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 in nearby villages. So when we talked to them, so they shared a lot of good stories, like uh, they get uh, very soft loans and support from the government to build their houses. And they get, get financing to run their businesses. Basically, uh, basically, Tibet region is uh, their their uh, main is uh, farming and uh, tourism. So, uh, for uh, they 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 buy, buy they get support from the local government also. And I was told that even some other provinces of China they also help uh, Tibet region to uh, develop more and to uh, upbring their uh, people more. So, I think this is good combination of the uh, central government and the uh, Tibet autonomous region itself and the some other provinces who help. So uh, I could easily see the, the high standard of uh, uh, living of uh, people like uh, if I mention so I can mention the uh, road network which is very good and also uh, the facilities uh, like uh, uh, is, is, the, is the health facilities, like I mentioned, the education, and then the uh, small businesses, and then the job opportunities. So uh, uh, after all these uh, f facility that, that, that help the uh, living standard of people. So I think that uh, what I have seen with my own eyes, naked eyes, so I, 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 I have seen, you know, ha happy faces. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have seen the prosperity. And uh, it, it, it's, it looks like a shining, shining diamond-like. So, 
So, uh, so when, when we talk about the poverty, so poverty means that, you know, very depressed people and uh, no, you know, no infrastructure, no uh, transportation, no electricity, no other facilities. Even if you go to, at the top of a, uh, of a mountain, even you, you, you can use your mobile. Yeah, or mobile phone. Yeah, there is a signal, right? Yeah, yeah, you can get a signal over there. And then, you know, uh, it's a, like, you know, if you want to go to some scenic spot, you can easily get transportation. Mm -hmm. It is very good transportation network. A strong infrastructure. Very strong. I know, like, uh, last time I was in, uh, in Xizam, uh, there was no such, uh, you know, recently they said there's opening of a high-speed railway yeah. uh, between Lhasa and Linji. I also. You took that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, I also. We took that uh, high-speed train from uh, Linji to Lhasa. And traveling on, 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 it, on a train, on that train, it was, uh, it was very unique experience. It took around uh, four hours from Linjie to Lhasa. And uh, we got experience of uh, traveling on a, on a train that, uh, that runs on the world high, highest altitude. <laughs> so it was yes. itself, a, you know, it was very, and, and I think, uh, I think that it, it, it is not easy to construct uh, the rail, 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 rail line on, on such a high altitude, it, it, it had, took a, it had uh, you know, uh, taken a lot of efforts. Right. It, right. it was not easy, the but how, they have made. Yeah, there's, I mean, one of the challenges is high yeah. altitudes. Even for people, if you visit there as a traveler, I mean, you can feel sometimes the oxygen issue, for, for yeah, example. Right. And, and uh, I also want to uh, share my uh, experience, uh, particularly about Lhasa. In 2018, when I visited Lhasa, it was not such a big city. And it, it, it has grown very fast during the last five, six years. Mm -hmm. And uh, even I have uh, seen the new international airport. Before when, to the, to in 2018, when I visited mm -hmm. first time Lhasa, so its uh, airport was a very small. And, uh, but now it is like an international airport and a lot of uh, planes. More facility now. Yeah, very, very. And also, uh, we visited uh, uh, Tibet University one of its campus and then in the in, in city you can feel uh, that it's uh, a lot of uh, progress is being carried out and uh, to my opinion Lhasa city is growing very fast and uh, if you look at it uh, look at its uh, infrastructure transportation other facility international uh, hotels for uh, international uh, and domestic tourists so everything and then, uh, of course, if we don't talk about Potala Palace, that is the actual uh, place to see in, uh, and, uh, and, and, and even that, that has been preserved in a remarkable way. And uh, the people uh, who uh, are there, uh, like as caretaker and uh, other religious people, they have full freedom. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have seen people, uh, you know, uh, there uh, who, who who believe in Buddhism, so they are free to exercise their uh, religious belief. Religious beliefs, and people are uh, just uh, following their uh, culture, their mm -hmm. tradition. Um, you know, some people would say, you know, along with modernization, development, urbanization, in particular, uh, there is inevitably, you know, probably to some extent, the weakening of you know, quote unquote, tradition yeah, or yeah, culture. Yeah, 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 yeah. Probably it's the same for you know, all, all cultures, you know, in a sense. Today's modernization could be tomorrow's tradition. Yeah, you, in are, a right. Sense, right? you are right. I totally agree because, you know, if, we, if you cannot deprive people or on the name of, you know, culture, religion, tradition, you cannot deprive that, them of uh, uh, development, economic progress, prosperity, mm -hmm. you know, you, you cannot no. deprive them. No. I, I think that the, the, the balance is the key. So, if, uh, if, if the, uh, the, the balance has been created and at the same time they are enjoying uh, their uh, socio-economic development and also they, they, they are able to preserve their language, their culture, their tradition, everything. So I think this is a good, com this is a good example. This is a good model also. And I think this model can be, be ad uh, ad ad adopted by other uh, regions and countries also. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, uh, because 
before going you know i was just thinking that i am going a far 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 area far flung area and uh, when you you know talk about the birth and you know it's so many old things in your mind okay i will go there and there will be you know people like they are living in the caves and they are you know uh, representing the old times so no this is not you you can get the uh, both things modern tibet and also the traditional tibet yeah i think that this is this is a this is a big success that you are just keeping preserving your religion your culture tradition everything at the same time you are providing people with the modern facilities like the uh, road networks high quality transportation then uh, good housing health education i think the people even even uh, any you know uh, people belong to any religion or any if they follow any tradition they need all these facilities right uh, another you know often a criticism often heard is uh, you know the people say people questioning uh, we know the full name of this region is called like xizang autonomous region people would say uh, questioning whether there's a true autonomy uh, in terms of uh, their own policy making, in terms of preserving uh, probably development or preserving the culture, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, what do you think of that? To my opinion, I, the people of the people of that region they en enjoy complete freedom, and 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 with the support of uh, the central government, they are making this uh, rapid development. I think without you know uh, with the without the support of uh, of uh, central government I mean the Chinese government and uh, the, that is uh, being led by the CPC uh, it's it, it was not possible so uh, they are growing together with the uh, with the support of uh, you know the whole country Foundation. not uh, and, and and just I mentioned that the some provinces are also supporting uh, to for the uplift of uh, the area and the people of Tibet, mm -hmm. so it is it is together. It is it, it, it is yeah. joint. It, these are the joint efforts. Yeah, no one yeah. will be left yeah. behind. Right? So it is like a family. You know, in a family, if there are six, seven brother, one or two, three are rich, and one or two are very poor. If the rich, they 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 will not help the poor. Then then how can poor? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. can stand there on their their feet. So it, it is it is a family. It is a family. Yes. Um, there's a message sent by President Xi Jinping to this uh, forum saying that, you know, ha happiness or living happily is the most important point in terms of human rights and development is a key to achieve uh, that kind of happiness. Uh, what do you make of that? You know, my, my opinion is that, okay, uh, you have your uh, point of view, your you, maybe you have different tradition, culture, even religion. But without, you know, economic empowerment, you cannot do anything. You, you, you cannot enjoy your life. So this uh, social and economic empowerment is the key. I totally agree that you, together you can rise. So uh, I think that the, the people of uh, Tibet are fully enjoying their uh, rights, rights of uh, freedom, to religion, then culture, tradition, and they are, you know, free to speak their language. I have seen, you know, the signboards and everywhere the, the Tibetan languages was written everywhere. So, so they, 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 so, so the area that is uh, called Tibet is, it's not less than, you know, like if you have such facilities in Beijing. So you, you don't think that you don't have in, in Lhasa. So, so I think that all that facilities which are available in other parts of China that are also available in Tibet, that is the key. That is, that is the success. Mm -hmm. Thank you for speaking with us. Let's have a short break. We'll be back right after this. Welcome to Dialogue. Uh, I know this is your first time uh, to the Xizang region, and so must be an eye-opener, the trip. So what impressed you, you know, there? 
Well, there were so many things, so many things to process, and it will take me some weeks and months to process them. But the, uh, there's three things really that struck me most. The first one was the economic development in Shitsang. Everywhere you looked, everywhere you looked, there was evidence of economic development. It's not overnight, it takes a long time. Um, new infrastructure or rebuilt infrastructure, road, railway, telecommunications, all those sorts of things. Uh, new uh, modern buildings but reflecting Shitsang style. Uh, and so on and so on. Uh, it was just uh, absolutely astonishing. And it's one thing to read about it, one thing to research it, which, which I have done in the past. It's entirely another thing to see it firsthand, experience it firsthand. Um, related to that, of course, is poverty alleviation um, and some of the most difficult areas to, in the world, the remotest areas in the world. And then on the basis of the economic uh, development as a foundation, what it was struck me, it was the development or flourishing of, of Shitsang culture and education. And this is, it's not just a preservation of traditional culture, because culture is always renewing itself generation after generation. And that can happen with a, a firm economic foundation. And we visited a, a primary school, uh, Xiao Shui, also a high school, Zhong Shui, and a university. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was also very, very interesting that at the schools they would learn a very sort of good teaching and, you know, obviously we, the latest uh, knowledge and methods, even an artificial intelligence lab in, um, and this was in the high school, not in the university, uh, but also the way in which the children were being taught in their own language. So, and learning all about the, their own history, their own culture, while also Chinese history, Chinese, Chinese culture, culture. National language. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it's a rather comprehensive development. And you have attended this uh, you know, forum on the development uh, for the Xizang region. Of course, we are talking about uh, over the past 72 years since its liberation. What's your takeaway? Uh, well, I was very much struck initially by the letter from uh, President Xi Jinping, where he went right to the point and emphasized that the core human right in China is economic development, or as we can say, socio-economic well-being, uh, right to the point. And uh, that set the tone, uh, from my perspective anyway, for the rest of the forum. I mean, you are expert on the religious um, you know, studies and the philosophy. I wonder how do you see this involvement or evolution of uh, say religious practice in Xizang? and also uh, at the same time the development, the modernization. Mm. Uh, you know, like, of course, we, you know, we try to preserve as much as possible uh, the tradition, the practice, the, you know, uh, the practice of religion, uh, religion for example. Um, how, do you, how do you see it and, you know, like over the past 72 years? Obviously, it evolves. It does evolve. Uh, it, it, it's my sense in the case of Shitsang, and you could look at other examples of that, it, it, religion shouldn't be separated out from the whole cultural framework. Uh, and so after Buddhism comes into, into uh, Shitsang and develops a particular characteristics in Shitsang, you can't really think about the whole culture, the whole cultural tradition, without thinking about the role of religion. On the other hand, you can't separate religion out from that wider framework. So I, would, I was talking with some people there who were not, you would say, well, let me use a term, uh, it, it's a rough term, believing Buddhists, put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so they wouldn't make a point of uh, excessive you know, prayers or gifts at, at uh, you know, a temple or something like that. But the religious dimension of Buddhism within uh, Shitsang culture and the way it has developed is an inescapable part of the wider cultural framework and the way people think. And it's that way that I approach the question of preservation, but also renewal that takes place. And I've been absolutely fascinated by the way that the government uh, in China and the regional governments, but the central government has been developing a policy or a religious policy in which the various religions uh, develop in a way that is supportive of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, and that's a very, very interesting development. How does it work? Well, if we look at some of the core values, the core socialist values, then we can see resonance 
that come of, of the values out of, for example, uh, Islam in China, Buddhism in China, and even Christianity in China in that way. There are values that come out of those traditions that have resonance with core socialist values. And it's to foster those uh, values and see the way they link with one another. And of course, you know, in preserving or in trying to preserve the tradition, the religion, the cultural characteristics uh, of uh, the Tibetan culture, for example, at the same time, you want to develop this region, exactly. economic growth in particular. There's a modernization drive. Exactly. So then there's an issue of striking a balance between you know, different factors here. And some would say uh, problem. You know, there's, there are cr criticism of, uh, oh, there's a loss of culture, loss of, uh, say, uh, religious freedom. Or, but the same, I guess, you know, if you develop and uh, as you say, I think that's a good word, renewal sometimes probably of, uh, of, them, of the practice. Well, th there's a, a couple of ways I like to look at this, and I am actually a political philosopher um, mainly. Um, uh, there is actually a process here. Now, the German term is Aufhebung, which means to not abolish, but move beyond the old and transform to a new level. And the Chinese translation, now my pronunciation is not quite correct, is, is Yangqi, which also means to discard the old dross, as it were, the, the relics of, of feudal assumptions, and to take the essence and develop it further. And it's that particular process that is very, very important, uh, because uh, uh, it's important, to, at least from my perspective, that traditional culture is not fixed. It's, uh, there's a kind of sediment that's there, but it's not fixed. It's always in process of renewal and development in light of the new situation, especially so with modernisation. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. It's a dialectical relationship dialectical between relationship. them. It's, a re it's about like a, how to keep a balance between the exactly. two. Uh, you want to develop basic development in both aspects. Exactly. And people, people do develop and change their perspectives, but they do so in light of what they've inherited. Yes. It's that, you know, we don't, uh, we don't choose the conditions into which we are born, but we can work to shape them in a better direction mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, then, you know, there are some others uh, who uh, are saying that, uh, that, that Xizang's development uh, is accompanied with uh, the restrictions of uh, religious freedom or, you know, probably, uh, uh, you know, restrictions of human rights practice of their how do you see that kind of, a, let's say, accusation or criticism there? Uh, short answer, it's a bucket of lies, um, but there's a purpose to it. And I always go back when people mention this thing. Already in the early 1950s, uh, Premier Zhou Enlai pointed out, uh, when China was obviously still very poor and much weaker than today, that the imperialists would try to break up China, uh, whether it's Xizang, Xinjiang, he mentioned it in Mongolia and so on in his comments. Uh, this is not a new practice. And so even though it's, as I say, a bucket or an empire of lies, it's objectively false. That's the case. There's a purpose behind it, which is to foster an effort to try and break up the country into different parts. And it's, this is not a new trick. They tried the same thing with the Soviet Union and eventually worked in a time of weakness there. It has been there for many, many decades, yeah. let's say. And it goes in cycles too. So, you know, there's still some focus on Xizang, but it's actually dropped off the agenda in some countries like Australia, and the focus has shifted to Xinjiang. Um, but again, I look at the turning that took place there. Belt and Road Initiative was announced not long be uh, before then. As we know, Xinjiang is an absolute hub for the Belt and Road but also Sinopec announced the discovery in the Tarim Basin of significant oil and gas reserves and later some more reputedly the largest in Asia. So there are quite concrete uh, you know, reasons for these. For these. Yes. Uh, nowadays, uh, internationally, we see the US is basically launching a, you know, some people would call that a new Cold War or containment policy uh, against China. So sometimes you do see uh, questions like Taiwan, Hong Kong, or Tibet, or mm. Xinjiang could be used or, say, weaponized against uh, you know, well, its major competitor here in China, right? Sure. <laughs> so do, do you see that uh, probably this 
kind of criticism or sometimes attacks will continue? It's, it, that's a, a complex question because uh, last year, uh, my understanding is US-China trade was the highest level it, it had been for a very long time. So if we consider the economic base, the economies are highly integrated. So what's the function of this, well, that's what they call a political level, ideological level, what is the function of that when at the same time there's far greater e economic integration between the two countries or in the situation of Australia as well. It's a smaller economy but highly complementary with China and any serious business in Australia, in Australia if it hasn't got engagement in, in uh, China is wanting to be engaged and they're, they're expecting a bumper year this year. I tend to look at that level and then ask well what's the function of all this rhetoric, all this, well, empty gesturing, if you like. I think it's actually more a reflection of internal contradictions in the countries themselves, especially the United States. It's actually an internal problem that they have rather than something, and it manifests itself in these external processes. Uh, the United States is not going to war with anyone because it would harm their fundamental interests. They would love to encourage someone else to do so, but they won't. Proxy war, let's say. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Yes. A, a good point in the reflection of their own problems, probably. Definitely, there's no lack of that. That's right. um, but look into, say, the next uh, decade, five to 10 years or decades beyond that. Um, what do you see the development or the prospect of, uh, of the Xizang region, of the people's development to? Well, I mean, the development in the last 10, and if we go back 20 years, has been extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Um, it's a shorthand way of putting it, but it's on the path to common prosperity. Let's put it a shorthand way. And I use a framework of uh, my research in Marxist political philosophy. And I, use, I approach this from the history of a Marxist approach to human rights. And the core human right, as it has emerged from that, is socio-economic well-being, or as we now know, common prosperity. And it's that path where Xi Jinping's development is, can't be separated out from the rest of China in that case. But the further that Xi Jinping develops economically, culturally, educationally, ecological civilization, the greater will be Xi Jinping's involvement with the rest of China and also the strengthening of Chinese unity Again, that's a dialectical relationship where you, you foster autonomous uh, practices in light of concrete conditions as life improves for everyone, you lead then to greater unity in the process. Thank you, Professor Bo. Thank you for speaking with us. With that, we come to the end of today's discussion. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.